Hey, hey, this is Ben Krause on February 9th of this uh, fantabulous Friday. Looking forward to the weekend. I am uh, your host and founder of the group, also a veteran rights attorney and journalist here to talk about all things Voc Rehab. We will mainly be talking today about the GI Bill versus Voc Rehab and which should a veteran use first. It's a big question. Lots of veterans uh, ask this for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, some of the questions are like, well, which one pays you more? Which one covers, you know, uh, certain schools? Which ones don't, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully dispel some of the myths and, and legends about uh, Volk Rehab versus GI Bill. And uh, a lot of counselors are confused or try to steer veterans in one direction or another. And I want to help you know, shed a little bit of light into the darkness as far as that goes. So having said that, I uh, want to invite and thank uh, many of you newbies here to the particular office hours. I try to hold these every week, although sometimes I don't, <laughs> mainly due to legal stuff when I'm, when I'm working on cases where I, I just can't break away. But uh, this particular Friday, we are in luck because I've been sick all week and don't have uh, anything going on. Uh, for that reason. So I'm able to break away and do a little bit of office hours uh, action. Uh, for the newbies here, I want to talk a little bit about the group etiquette so that you don't get kicked out. Uh, some pretty basic stuff here. Uh, be polite to others. Be professional. Don't lip off to me or uh, my wife, who happens to be the other administrator. Um, try to be helpful and, and uh, not hurtful when you're responding to one another. Uh, be critical, though, and it's important that we are critical with one another, but that does not mean be a jerk. So I really hope that y'all can kind of uh, understand the, the fine line between being a jerk and being critical. So uh, that's uh, some of the rules. And also, um, this is a group that's pro-veteran and not necessarily pro-VA. Uh, that's okay. We encourage uh, ripping on the agency uh, here because I think it's an important thing for veterans to do so they have an opportunity to uh, vent when frustrated and to... Um, you know, basically let it be known how they're feeling without having to worry about uh, being judged by a VA employee or having people complain about how dare they, you know, criticize the federal government, oh, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, that's uh, what, we're, what we're all about here, helping the veteran out, uh, not too worried about how the, the, the feelings of the agency. Uh, so, so that's uh, part of the deal. A little bit, again, for the newbies about this group, I founded it back in 2009 because at that time, None of the veteran organizations were really talking about Volk Rehab. It wasn't a thing. Everyone assumed that the program was administered properly. And so a lot of veterans didn't get the benefits they were promised, including myself at that time, um, because we relied on the agency and relied on VSOs to, to help us and to be our advocates when they really weren't. So I created this group to create a little bit of transparency and also founded the website called disabledveterans.org. That is the website where I expose VA scandals every single day um, or just news or tips about benefits. So that's what I do there. Uh, that website was purchased with my own disability compensation money. And I fund the operation by selling a book. That book is called uh, The Voc Rehab Survival Guide, which is the only book of its kind uh, written for the purpose of helping veterans understand Voc Rehab. It is approximately 120, give or take, pages uh, nowadays. Um, helps veterans access the benefit and understand how to not get denied the first time around. Although, you know, some of us do get denied. There are no guarantees with VA. I did create that book so that I didn't have to rewrite an entire book every single time somebody asked me about how I got law school paid for, et cetera, et cetera. So I created a book, uh, you know, makes me a capitalist. And I sell that book to fund all the software costs related to disabledveterans.org. And my work as an investigative journalist, uh, the website itself costs about a thousand to two thousand dollars to operate, not just the housing uh, related to the host, but also my research uh, software and other things that I use to uh, try to get at the truth related to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, truth is not cheap and it is not free. Uh, I know a lot of us seem to think that it is, but it's not. It's very expensive, in fact, to uh, run a publishing company, um, just software costs alone. So you got to pay for that somehow. Otherwise, it'd be an expensive uh, hobby that my wife would certainly make me shut down. So uh, so luckily, with your contributions and purchase of the Voc Rehab Survival Guide, 
uh, you help us uh, keep the keep the ball rolling here. You help me investigate the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, uh, most recently, we are trying to understand why uh, VA did not pay <laughs> pay veterans their subsistence payment after the shutdown. So we believe here uh, at DisabledVeterans.org and in this forum that the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, made an interesting error where 11,000 veterans did not receive their subsistence payment on time in February. Uh, we believe that it was because of the uh, very interesting government shutdown two weeks ago, although it may also have to do with uh, there being a new boss in uh, the uh, employment arena, uh, whose name is Rob Reynolds. Kurt Coy uh, was recently forced out of his position with, as I understand it, false allegations. And so he stepped down because he just got tired of it and retired. And now it is run by Rob Reynolds. Rob used to be, uh, he's, he's uh, basically an Allison Hickey holdover. Rob Reynolds um, used to run the Disabled American Veterans Organization that many of us know. Uh, I myself am a member, uh, not an active mem member, but I am a member there. And so he used to run that while also working at the VA and created a, an interesting relationship between that organization and the inter tranches of the agency. And so now he's in charge of all things related to both rehab uh, and other kinds of programs. So he's not like directly in charge of Oak Rehab, though. That is still Jack Kamur, but he's in charge. He's the OEO uh, assistant undersecretary, something like that. I'm working on getting an org chart here as we speak, and I'll be able to uh, provide that to all of you so you can see exactly how the VA operates. But we are uh, looking at trying to investigate and expose why uh, Volk Rehab and other programs don't work right. And so we're very concerned about the obvious breakdown between central office and Jack's program and the field. And man, I'll tell you, we just can't figure out why they're so disconnected. And uh, what we are realizing is that uh, Jack has little to no control over what the field does. And in fact, the field is under the uh, control of another individual with first name Willie. And Willie runs what's called the Office of Field Operations. So uh, they answer to Willie and not to uh, Jack, which is interesting. And so um, there are a lot of different issues and elements and layers and whatnot that we're trying to expose within the Department of Veterans Affairs. That's just one example, trying to understand why veterans did not get their payment. We believe that the uh, failure to pay uh, resulted in the veteran population being withheld about $16 million because they made a glitch. We don't know what glitch means. We only know that a glitch occurred and that the agency confirmed that it happened. We don't know why, we don't know how, and we also do know, though, that a lot of veterans still have not received the payment. So the VA tried to fix that by rendering a payment uh, February 5th or thereabouts. Uh, a lot of veterans have not been paid, so we're trying to figure out why, uh, because, you know, knowing why veterans didn't get paid is important because it is their, you know, property, and it should have been paid on time and any time that there's a problem like that, we definitely want to know. I mean, where'd the $16 million go? Geez, why, why wasn't it paid in the way that it should have been? So we're trying to get to the bottom of that. Um, running a survey, uh, just a simple survey. It's not scientific on the forum right now to find out who didn't get paid. And so anyone who didn't get paid uh, and those that did get paid in time, please, you know, go there and comment. So we understand from our perspective, you know, what this looks like. The, the agency is not used to a group of this size. You have to remember that at any active moment, the active cases uh, supposedly is uh, between 11,000 and 17,000, somewhere in there. Invoke Rehab, our group, as you'll realize, is 25,000. So, uh, you know, Invoke Rehab has never had a, a group of veterans like this gathered together in one place where we can all talk about the program. Uh, publicly and transparently. So they're not uh, used to it. And that's, you know, one of the advantages of, you know, going private and not relying on, you know, those veteran organizations, the dinosaur VSOs, um, who are, you know, tend to be the power, power brokers and, and holders of a lot of uh, money. Um, that doesn't seem to somehow filter back to the veteran population exactly. Uh, not sure exactly what's going on there. But uh, between the VSOs and the VA, you know, we're, we're, we're just digging into exactly what's going on. You know, was a vendor involved? You know, what's the issue? So with any stroke of luck, we'll get Trump's attention and, and his team may look into it. Yeah, they may not, but who knows? So uh, now that we're entering into the second government shutdown in a month, 
or um, you know, some of these veterans uh, could run into problems, especially if uh, this issue is not resolved and then it goes into an actual full on shutdown. And even if there is a shutdown evasion over the next you know, month or so uh, without a resolution, we're gonna run into the same problem again. And uh, then veterans are gonna be having issues with payments again just like we had in 2013 when there was another shutdown that the federal government did not uh, apparently plan for. And so they left veterans in the lurch and uh, people like me were the only folks out there trying to talk to us, uh, one another, so that we could share best practices and, and not you know, end up in the poorhouse uh, while the VA played with our funds and hid them behind paywalls. So here we are uh, moving forward. So anyway, appreciate your time and your patience and tuning in here and contribution of the group. Uh, very happy about that. There are a lot of free resources on the website, disabledveterans.org, which is linked uh, on this particular video and on other videos here uh, that I've been doing. So you can grab that link and go to the website. There are free resources, answers to lots of questions that I get asked all the time. One of those questions that we're going to be talking about here, which is, hey, man, should I use the GI Bill or should I use Voc Rehab? Well, man, you are in luck. I have used both of those programs. And so I'm able to uh, sit here and talk to you a little bit about the pros and cons. And, you know, based on my experience and helping veterans understand their options, you know, for many years, uh, now we are able to uh, collate that data and give you some of the best practices that we understand. So to give you a little bit of the overview about what is going on, there is a GI Bill, uh, post 9-11 GI Bill, to be specific, I believe now it's called the Forever GI Bill or something like that. They're always changing the name. But uh, nonetheless, there's the GI Bill. The GI Bill is awesome. It pays a lot of money to veterans, uh, both disabled and non-disabled, and you can do lots of things with it. Some of the things you can do with it, you can't do with voc rehab. So for example, if you want to study basket weaving, or if you want to get your private pilot's license, or you want to do a lot of other, you know, whatever it is, you know, you want to uh, learn how to pogo stick at a university somewhere at some small liberal arts college. Whatever you want to do, you tend to be able to do with the GI Bill in that capacity. However, voc rehab, not so much. Voc rehab, the goal is to help you get retrained into a field that is suitable for you so that you can find and maintain uh, suitable employment uh, for the rest of your days forever and ever, amen. So that's the whole point of a voc rehab and the subtle difference of GI Bill. You can do more with it. Uh, but, you know, the downside of the GI Bill, well, you know, you don't, you don't get some of the frill benefits, such as uh, accommodative systems that you get uh, through Voc Rehab. You don't get the tuition coverage at private universities if you're able to get accepted into one. Um, what else? You don't, uh, anyway, you get the picture. There's a bunch of fees, whatever, that you get with Voc Rehab you don't get um, through just the GI Bill. So it's important to understand that difference. Now, um, one of the other elements of the GI Bill that are very lucrative, um, or at least I should say uh, uh, useful for veterans, is that you end up with a higher subsistence payment than you do under traditional voc rehab. Traditional voc rehab uh, payments generally suck. Uh, if you're a single veteran, you will get 600 bucks. Um, if you are a single veteran, you know, in the GI Bill program, you get somewhere between, I want to say, 1400 on the low end and up to like over 4000 on the high end, depending on if you're like in New York City or, or some other, you know, location. So there is a huge like upswing on the GI Bill. Luckily for many veterans, you don't have to actually really pick, you know, so long as, of course, you don't want to do basket weaving or something like that. Um, if you want to do pretty much the same thing and pretty much the same thing will result in you getting um, substantive gainful employment. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, the important element to, to re remember here is that with the GI Bill, you get 36 months, give or take, depending on, you know, your circumstance. With voc rehab uh, and other ed, ed benefits, depending on the combination, it's up to 48 months. And it's actually beyond 48 months for some veterans with a serious employment handicap. So that's the other nuance with voc rehab, right? You could use it forever. And if you happen to opt into Voc Rehab and you get approved for one of those longer programs that's longer than 48 months, you get to opt in for the higher GI Bill subsistence payment amount, so long as you still had eligibility under the post 9-11 GI Bill, uh, to receive that amount while in Voc Rehab. And so here's what this means. I was able to get, uh, work, get this worked out for a veteran recently in a case uh, where the veteran was approved for law school. So in that instance, the veteran had a couple months left of the post 9-11 GI Bill, we won his appeal, so it was great, and now he's gonna be an awesome lawyer. 
Uh, but that veteran was in an area where the uh, amount you would receive for the GI Bill was over four grand, right, or something along those, those lines. It was a lot of money. And so luckily, this individual was able to save their, you know, eligibility. It just had a couple months and uh, opted for the higher GI Bill amount while in folk rehab for the remainder of their training, which in this instance was not just for law school, but it was also to get um, a master's degree in forensic psychology in addition to the law degree. So we're talking about a hybrid program that could have been up to 48 months in addition to the undergrad. Amazing opportunity. And so in that instance, that veteran not only received, you know, tuition covered, uh, any accommodative systems taken care of, you know, dental, all that crap. But in addition to that, he was able to get the GI Bill at the higher amount. And so in that area, it was four grand a month. So if you can imagine for four years getting four grand a month, you know, you do the math, that's a hell of a lot of money just in subsistence payment, not to mention the additional amount uh, uh, for tuition coverage, and except, you know, all that. So that veteran in particular, uh, that was a $200,000, give or take, uh, swing in their financial position just because they were smart enough to hire an attorney to fix their uh, situation. So uh, anyway, that's an example of the difference. And so some veterans are, are, are telling me that their counselor is saying, hey, they're telling me I need to use the GI Bill first and then use Chapter 31. Nonsense. That is complete nonsense. In fact, don't do it because here's what will happen. You'll get close to or finish your degree and then you'll go in for voc rehab because, you know, you trust them. And they'll say, oh, well, you already have this uh, degree and you're done with it. So you don't get voc rehab benefits at all. Piss off. And that happens often. And so then they say, well, you're qualified for suitable employment. You don't need us anyway. Well, that sucks, right? Because if you would have been in the program initially, it would have been much easier to argue that you needed the higher level education under 38 CFR 21. 0.72, higher level of education, meaning maybe a master's degree or some advanced graduate program. Uh, but because you used up your GI Bill entitlement uh, for the undergrad, then they're like, oh, you already have an undergrad, uh, too late. You can go, instead of being a lawyer, you can go be a paralegal, that's it, you know, whatever, you're done. So um, anyone who is watching this and your counselor, if your counselor tells you use up the GI Bill first or tells you that it's some kind of crazy requirement, they are completely lying to you. Don't do it. Definitely opt in for the GI Bill, you know, kicker or whatever it is, the higher subsistence payment after you're in Chapter 31. But don't do it the other way around. You will lose out. And in addition to that, um, unless you have a serious employment handicap, you're always going to be capped at 48 months. Unless you have a serious employment handicap or there's some other reason why you're able to move around that cap. So... There's no sense, there's no reason to not use it up, right? Get in there, use it as far as you can go. And then, you know, if you don't have a serious employment handicap, at least hopefully you can burn up the full 48 months. But getting in there for that window after you finish the undergrad for then, you know, any kind of remainder, once you're done with that undergrad, you're going to be locked out of the program. I guarantee it the way that they're processing claims now. So uh, don't do it. Opt in. It's your right to request and receive voc rehab benefits do them, you know, definitely take that opportunity, make that request, use the higher subsistence payment if you still have it available to you, which can be very lucrative um, and really help you focus on your studies and make sure that you're not, you know, requiring food stamps like a lot of veterans when you're in the program uh, because of the lower subsistence payment for voc rehab. So don't listen to them. If anyone tells you to use up your GI Bill first, unless you want to do basket weaving or to get your private pilot's license or some other thing that you can't accomplish in voc rehab, just do voc rehab and opt for the higher payment amount. Hopefully, you'll have enough wherewithal to be able to request the higher level training if you have a serious employment handicap, and I can go on and on about this uh, for quite some time. But uh, I hope that it kind of dispels any myth about why they use the GI Bill first. You know, it's really kind of nonsense. Uh, there were older understandings related to how the GI Bill worked and some confusion even within the agency where that might have made sense at one point in time, but it doesn't make sense now. And now is 2018. Now, in my opinion, um, unless you want to go to school for basket weaving, definitely use Chapter 31 and opt in for the higher subsistence payment. There's no reason to not do that. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, let's see here, answer a few questions. So, hey, Joe. Uh, thanks for checking in. I got William has a couple questions. Uh, Malcolm, 
yeah, mentions book rehab is better. I agree. Uh, Rob has a question and then Valerie. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate that. Valerie Smith making some money is okay. Yes. And believe me, those other companies that are in there, you know, helping the VA. Yeah, right. They're making millions and billions of dollars helping. Yeah. Okay. So I don't feel bad for selling a guide for 20 bucks, but you know, it is what it is. Um, anyway, so I want to answer a few of the questions here. If you have any questions, definitely uh, put those into the comment section. Um, a lot of what I've seen so far dealt with, um, should I use chapter 31 uh, or GI Bill? So uh, that's why I picked that topic for this particular thing. So uh, I hope that that helps. <laughs> Somebody asked uh, Jeremy Dunman, what the hell is wrong with dental and folk rehab? I just want them to take my damn tooth out. That is all. It's killing me. <laughs> all right. Well, they're supposed to, if, if it's a medical emergency or, or the equivalent, um, they should be setting you up with dental to get that pulled, whether it's in the local VA dental or somewhere else, you have that entitlement. They should be helping you. So uh, just, they don't have an option. So your, your counselor should put in the request. Uh, so I see a few folks writing about using post 9-11 first, um, Daniel Dyer, Diana Mystery, a few others. Definitely, you know, you want to, uh, they're lying to you, you know, it just, I have no other way to put it, you know, by them pressuring you to do it, they're basically trying to get you to not uh, make them work and do their job. And so that's, that's a problem. Um, let's see here. Bum, 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 a mess. Uh, okay, so a few people are asking about getting Dragon and what it takes. So uh, Voc Rehab has changed their policy. I'm not sure if it's legal the way they've changed it or, or permissible, but I do want to mention basically what they're forcing veterans to do now when you ask for accommodative systems is uh, they are forcing you to get a basically request through VHA, and then VHA is supposed to process it through their prosthetics department. Um, for accommodative systems. Now, I'm not sure that that's legal. You know, I think that Voc Rehab is fully capable of doing it all on their own, like big boys and girls, um, but they haven't been doing it. It's basically they're trying to shirk money uh, and, and overburden an already overburdened VHA system uh, to try to save money on the VA benefits side. This is being probably run through some kind of backdoor unethical policy that's being pushed from the Office of Field Operations, I'm going to guess. The money really needs to come from Voc Rehab because that's really what it's all about. Uh, but they're trying to basically rob from uh, Veterans Health Administration and overburden that system with requests that their counselors fully are capable of resolving themselves. Uh, they have training and reasonable accommodations in those systems and have the ability to buy them. What, they can take care of it. They used to take care of it. The push to no longer take care of it is likely because of, you know, Tom Murphy and some of his cronies. So uh, I'm looking into that. You know, there's something going on with those guys and Veteran Benefits Administration between Tom and Rob and Willie that I think is unethical. Um, a bunch of us here in the community are very concerned and troubled by what we've been seeing. Um, so they can guarantee that I'm going to be a bug up their ass um, up until they're out of the federal government trying to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to be your tapeworm, Tom. I'm your tapeworm, buddy. And I'm going to be in there trying to dig around to find out what's going on. So I just hope you realize that right now. Uh, Tom Murphy's the, well, they call him now the executive in charge, but he used to be the act called the acting undersecretary. And then they failed to replace him after like two or three years, however, two years, uh, which is obscene. And so Trump, uh, we're still waiting on you, Trump. <laughs> Get some new blood in there, please. Uh, we need some folks that are accountable. Uh, and right now the team that's in place is just not. So uh, there are some great people that are there, but the team that is in charge, Tom and a couple of his buddies, uh, they're just, you know, they're not doing things the right way, I don't believe. And they're forcing out good people and they're engaging in practices that are unethical. So that's all I got to say about that. Um, so let's see here. People asking about accommodative systems. Yep. Um, so yeah, Voc Rehab is shirking their responsibility there and trying to push it on a VHA and pull money out of the VHA budget for things that they are capable and able to and should pay for themselves. So, uh, we'll get into that at another time. Uh, Nikki Jose asks, can you use 
chapter 31 online courses. Um, yeah, sometimes, um, but they're, they frown on that more and more because the online education is not necessarily <clears throat> the best for some people. So some folks do it, some folks don't. Yeah, Rob Morris wrote in about that. Uh, some people do it, some don't. I personally am a big fan of uh, brick and mortar, but for people with, you know, certain PTSD or whatever, and they need to be kind of isolated, um, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't work for them. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways to basically skin the same cat. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get at here. Steve Miller uh, writes in, how can we advocate for veterans as a whole, starting with chapter 31? How can we organize and create a voice? Well, you got a voice. It's us. We're in this group. It's got over 25,000. There's no other group like it of this kind that's been around for so long. So you already are in the group. This is the group. Figure out how to make it go. You know, uh, it's not like any of us had to pay any kind of membership to be here. Just the fact that we're trying to, you know, get benefits or whatever ends up, you know, in this group. So uh, you got a group. I have a direct channel to all the heads of the VA. They know who I am. Um, I write about them on a regular basis. They um, are to some degree nervous about what I do, which is good. I mean, they should be always mindful of the fourth estate, which is the press. And that's what I do uh, when I'm not suing them as an attorney. So that's the other hat that I wear. Uh, so, you know, Stephen, to your question, this is the group, man. Uh, no sense in starting over. It took me, what, nine years to get to this point? Uh, eight year, yeah, nine years. So uh, no sense in starting over. Just, you know, try to sh share the word, investigate. Uh, you know, maybe what we ought to do in this group is to create a, like an educational platform to be citizen reporters. And then you guys as members of this group, uh, go report back to this group and publish it, you know, and, and that's what we do. And maybe put it out on disabledveterans.org, the website, so that people can see the product of your, you know, investigations. I mean, the only way to really get it done is do it ourselves, right? I mean, that's what we did in the military. You didn't wait around for some other Jack or Joe to come over and you know, dig the hole when you got to dig the hole yourself. So do it, pick up the ax, pick up the, you know, shovel and start, you know, slinging dirt, you know, that's the only way to get it done. So uh, don't rely on others, you know, um, to, to take care of it because they won't show up, you know, uh, they just don't. It's been my experience. You know, you got to really, you know, dig in, do it yourself. You know, it's just the way it is. Um, so would like to have another veteran, Wayne Williams asks about, the independent living program um, looks like he went through it in 03. Kind of wondering if he can get through it again. The answer is yes, you can reuse independent living. It is not a one-time program, although they will try to tell you it is. Uh, but you know, you're not you're not required to only use it once. So don't don't think that you are. Here we go. That's a little bit better. So don't think that you are. <clears throat> you can use it more than once. Um, Let's see here. Uh, what constitutes changing tracks? That is James, James uh, Howard. So um, essentially, and this is how it was explained to me by the director, Ruth Fanning. She used to be the director. Now the director is Jack Kimmer. Uh Fanning, when she was running the program, had told me that she believed the tracks were kind of supposed to be used interchangeably like different tools in a toolbox, although in reality, that's not how the counselors on the ground are doing it. That's part of the disconnect between uh, the Office of Field Operations and Voc Rehab Central where the policy is made, but where Jack has no control over what the field office is doing. Um, so anyway, uh, the, tr the track, you just put in a change. It's written, uh, I want to say it's 38 CFR 21.94 to 98. Uh, talk about changes and, and review and stuff like that. So take a look at that. You know, you basically just, you want to change uh, and you have a reason to believe that the change makes a rehabilitation more likely than the other option based on new evidence, usually a worsening of the service connected disability or something like that, or worsening of some other issue, you know, whatever it is um, that makes uh, rehabilitation under the new goal more likely. And then they should evaluate it. Uh, hopefully approve it. Oftentimes, though, you'll put in that request and they won't, um, they won't actually evaluate it the way they're supposed to. So, um, you know, just be mindful of that. So that's all. But yeah, just put in the request and see what happens. It's like a roller coaster sometimes. You never know. 
Uh, George Walsh asks, self-employment, how to deal with a VRC <clears throat> that has not done it before? Well, they have guidelines they're supposed to follow. Um, you know, yeah, this is, it's like an impossible question to ask, you know? <laughs> so um, I don't know the answer, George. Uh, but what I can tell you is that there's a first time for everything. These counselors are supposed to be able to do it. They're very well paid. Uh, they're supposedly well trained. Uh, oftentimes, they don't like doing the work. So, um, so the only hint I could tell you is that, you know, try to do most of the work yourself, but also be on your counselor to make sure they're moving the ball forward because they will try to avoid it um, because a lot of counselors try to avoid work. So, you know, it's really up to you. You're going to have to uh, be the master of your own destiny for self-employment. But there are there is information online 38 CFR, uh, gosh, what is it 256 or 63 263 I don't know somewhere in the in the 200s, uh, it talks about self employment and then the M 28R explains it. Uh, uh, if you were to Google like uh, vocational rehabilitation WARMS W A R M S, which is an acronym, it should come up and you'll be able to go through the M 28R there that was updated for self employment and that'll help you. You know I've been meaning to write a course about that. Um, and I just haven't, you know, I've been busy. So uh, anyway, I see a bunch of questions here, which is great. Uh, I'll try to go through these pretty fast. So let's see here. Uh, people talking about not getting paid. Um, counselors losing paperwork. I had 30 days, so I was able to get better. Um, Hey, Joe, thanks for the kudos. I appreciate that. So I'm going to read this off because it's, it's just a friendly word. Uh, so Joe Rowling says, uh, Ben, thanks for putting up the good fight. Uh, you are the reason I decided to move forward with VRE after being uh, oblivious to these benefits for 17 years. I feel blessed at 38 to get this opportunity, but it is with a serious employment handicap. Well, Joe, thank you. First of all, thank you for the kudos. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and, and thank you for, for mentioning your story. I think every time that we get uh, an example of another veteran who, who uh, made the jump is another example of this. It really helps us uh, all uh, collaborate and consolidate together to, you know, push forward for, for our own gain and also the gain of the country. Because ultimately, you know, the better you do, the more taxes you pay and everyone is better off, right? So, um, Let's see, Matthew Cephalo says, hey, Ben, um, I was told my, by my counselor that my GI Bill was expired as of December 14th. I'm currently waiting for my payment from Voc Rehab, but today I received a letter from VA saying that I still have three months of GI Bill and am entitled to full-time pay. I received 500 uh, in book allowance already, and I'm worried that they will go after me for, okay. So this deals with overpayment. Anytime you have a reason to believe that maybe you were overpaid, um, hold on to the money, don't spend it. And if, if you were overpaid, in fact, and, and they verify it with you, then pay them back, real simple. So if you don't believe that you received the appropriate amount of money, and in fact, you received too much, do not spend that money. Put it in the savings account, and then if they, you know, request the money later, then pay it back. Uh, so just it's it's that simple. So just be careful. You know, if you got too much money, don't spend it. Hold it. <laughs> pay it back. Uh, you know, it's real simple, man. <laughs> Sometimes those it doesn't take a lot of greed to know that one. Um, Zima Williams. I was told since I only have six months left on the post nine one GI bill that they wouldn't be able to help me do law school. Well, that's kind of weird. I called the VA education benefits number and they confirmed that I cannot use Voc Rehab for anything longer than the six months that I have left on the GI Bill. Well, God, that doesn't make any sense. It sounds like they're feeding you a line of BS there, Zima. So um, we know what the regs say. The regs say that uh, any combination, if you only have an employment handicap, which, you know, would be like, let's just guess, uh, if you have a 20% rating up to like 50, just hypothetically, um, that might be a, just a normal employment handicap. Now, if you, but you can have a serious employment handicap with only a 10% rating. Each case is very different. Um, so it's always important to keep that in mind. So you got to read through the regulations about 
the difference between an employment handicap and a serious employment handicap, which is uh, 38 CFR uh, 21.50 to 52. So then you go through and you figure that out. But anyway, so what they're telling you um, is <clears throat> it may be true that you're not qualified to get a, a law degree for some other reason, but the way or the reason that they're telling you you're not qualified is incorrect. Because what if you had a serious employment handicap? Well, then who cares how much time you have in the GI Bill? It doesn't matter at all. You still have at least, so if you have like, let's say we know for sure 36 months, right? Of the GI Bill is, is more or less the max. So based on, the, on that math or that calculus, you have 30 months that you've used, six months left. We know that you have 12 months more because the cap is 48 months. Six plus 12 equals 18. That's a year and a half of school. Most master's degrees can be accomplished in a year and a half. Um, now, a law degree takes more time, but if you're approved for a law degree, they have to pay it. So until they evaluate you to see if a, you know, a lawyer is your suitable um, occupational goal and that it's appropriate, uh, until they adjudicate that question and whether that's true, um, no one knows the answer. So whoever's telling you this is just don't know what they're talking about. So, you know, it's another example of poorly trained individuals that don't read the regulations. They just read some kind of talking point from the Office of Field Operations, OFO and Willie, Willie, you know, Ugh, that guy, you know. It's his, his crew, man, his crew of misfits and miscreants that are really confusing the hell out of a lot of veterans. Um, so until they're, you know, get their wagons fixed, you know, uh, these holdovers, uh, until we get people put in place that really know what they're doing, we're, you know, just going to have to fight, you know, get an attorney. That's what I do. Hey, that's why I get paid the big bucks. So if you want to hire me to represent you after you get denied, more than happy to, to fight for you, you know, so uh, just – Keep that in mind. Um, let's see here. So Chicola Barrington says, what's the best way to approach my counselor when it comes to getting voc rehab to pay for my master's after I finish a bachelor's? Um, so d it depends on where you live. Uh, if you live in an area where a master's degree might be something that's required to get uh, suitable employment because the area like a DC, Boston, San Francisco, where an advanced degree is almost expected, and if you don't have one, you're not going to be able to get the job. In that argument, you might be more likely to, you know, get a master's approved than if you're in, you know, rural America, especially in the South, where most people maybe don't graduate from high school, or if they do, that's it. They don't have an uh, undergrad. So each, each region has its own nuance. Um, and in the description you've given, though, uh, part of why you're going to run into problems is because you already have the bachelor's done. And this is why I always tell veterans, always apply for the master's or a change before you finish the undergrad. Because at least qualified for suitable employment, blah, blah, blah. It's one of their easiest, like, outs that they trick veterans into, into believing. So, for example, a lot of veterans believe and are told that, oh, yeah, we'll do a master's. But first, you got to do the bachelor's. We'll see how you do. And then, only then... Well, we consider, you know, the masters and write that up. Yeah, so go. And so people do that, and then they're, you know, then they're done, and they say, hey, buddy, I did my bachelor's. Now I'm ready for the master's. Like, oh, man, shucky darn. Didn't you realize you're qualified for suitable employment now? You don't need us. You just need to go get a job, buddy, a J-O-B. And so those individuals get hoodwinked, and then they're out. Okay, so if you're not, uh, not done yet, um, put in for the change. Make sure you say, I want a change. I want my ch a different goal and you explain it, that'll trigger their duty. And oftentimes they'll forget, oh, they got a duty, they have to evaluate it. Um, and then they'll just deny. And that's where I come in. When they deny you, hire me. <laughs> that's, that's where, uh, you know, that's where I make a living. So, uh, but that's unfortunately, that's where the, the tricks are. Um, so we'll just see. Sometimes you get a counselor that's with it and they're great and not a problem. But in the past two years, the Office of Field Operations has been clamping down on this program inappropriately because none of them are qualified to make the determinations there because they're not, uh, you know, a rehabilitation counselors themselves that are writing the policies, but they don't care, right? Because the VA just doesn't care anyway. They like to make stuff up. Um, and that's just how it is. Uh, so my feedback to you is put in for the change now. 
uh, and push, you know, make sure the master's degree though is something that you really want to do. Um, you know, it also helps if credentialing is the issue, but the particular degree type is not maybe that big of a thing. Uh, I always advise people to get the law degree because it's the quickest path to a doctorate. And it's usually, it's, it's a career path that you just can't do unless you get that degree, you know? So you could be in business and have any kind of degree, you know, it depends really on your, your emotional quotient and your ability to, you know, sell things, right. Uh, or manipulate people, unfortunately. So that's really a lot of business, you know, uh, and do math, right. So these are the, you know, basics. So you could really get a degree in practically anything and be great at business, you know, um, but you can't be a great lawyer with no law degree. It's just, you gotta have the law degree to be a lawyer. Uh, and you got to pass the bar to be an attorney, right? So to practice law, you got to have uh, a bar, to, bar uh, license. So uh, anyway, I hope that helps kind of thread the needle for you. Um, you know, pick a lottery. That's what I would do. Uh, so Jeff uh, Marble Anthony says, hey, Ben. Um, hey, Anthony. Um, hi, Ben. I'm very fortunate to be in this program and on this page. At the moment, I'm having some issues with certifying official. Oh, okay. Uh, I am classified as a full-time student, but my counselor, uh, but the certifying official in my school does not certify until the class has started. Like many veteran students, we chose the accelerated format, eight-month modules, to finish a lot quicker. Due to this method of certifying, it has reduced my subsistence allowance because of the, oh, I see, of not being full-time. So this would be something where you would need to talk to the certifying officials um, boss to change the policy above them. Um, they're following a policy. So you just need to address the policy and, and explain how it puts you into a hardship because of the way the agency interprets that particular thing. So that's, that's what I would do. So go over the head of the certifying official to find out how you can change it. Uh, Jeff Marble says, say, Volk Rehab approves a master's program. Why wouldn't they approve a doctoral program if a master's can be achieved in two years into a doctoral program? So Jeff, um, lots of veterans have gone through the program and received a PhD. So I hope that helps. Um, it just depends on each, each circumstance uh, and your goal. So like if your goal is to be a PhD professor, let's say, um, or a clinical psychologist, well, you're going to need the, um, you'll need the doctoral program. If your goal is to do something that can be accomplished with either a master's degree or a doctorate, then they will almost always invariably pick the master's degree and say you're good to go. So, um, so it depends. You got to line up the uh, output or the end result, which is the career type and the requirements of the career type with the educational path that's required. So, um, so I think the professorship is one of the ones that is probably the most clear example, but, um, or, I want to be a psychologist. Well, guess what? You need a PhD to be a psychologist. Um, there aren't actually a lot of other examples that I could think of other than uh, psychologists. And again, don't put counselor down because they'll give you an MA in counseling and then that's it. So you'll be stuck. And if you're in like New York, or there's no chance in hell you're ever going to be a recognized counselor for the most part without a PhD. Um, make sure that you really know what you're doing. Don't sell yourself short in the moment where they're like, oh, well, we'll see about the PhD later. No, it better be written down. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. Again, I'll say it again. If it's not written down, it didn't happen. <laughs> so whatever it is needs to be written down in that IWRP. It's Individualized Written Rehabilitation Plan. Better be in there because if it's not in there, it didn't happen. All right. It's very simple. All right, hope that helps. Uh, let's see, Al, uh, Ali Sharp says, hey, can I change counselors? Mine keeps giving me the runaround uh, about getting supplies like my computer. He has even had me drop a class because he dropped the ball with getting the computer that he agreed to get me last semester. Um, that's a problem. So I would, yeah, you could request a new counselor, but file a complaint and point out that that affected your, your schooling and that they uh, manipulated you into changing your uh, training path to accommodate their failure. I mean, that's, you know, really kind of a manipulation. And then they are getting you to collude with them 
uh, to evade accountability because of that failure. Um, they can get in trouble that's under fiscal responsibility for not getting you the things that you need in time. And by help, you know, enlisting you to basically help them evade accountability, that's really unethical for them. And they should probably uh, be investigated. Uh, that's just wrong. You know, if you saw a cop do that, hey, uh, you know, why don't you tailor the facts a little bit so that, uh, you know, that missing evidence uh, doesn't matter as much. I mean, that's, it's absurd. So I don't know why vocational counselors seem to think they can get away with it. Uh, it's, it's really unethical for them to put you under the, the gun like that. Uh, otherwise, I think that is it. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions. It's been 45 minutes. Well, hey, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I've had a lot of fun here uh, catching up. And, you know, hopefully those of you that didn't get paid get paid. I mean, my God, you know, uh, millions of dollars hanging out. No one knows where it is. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's in somebody's bank account. Anyway, uh, hopefully that money gets returned and then paid to the veterans that need it. Uh, thank you for your support. You know, tune in at disabledveterans.org where I'm constantly writing and talking uh, about scandals in the VA or these problems to hold those bozos accountable because no one else will. Uh, you know, I'm partnering up with different uh, reporters all the time to get the word out and you know, that's all you can really do as a reporter. Now, as a lawyer, that's a different story. You can get a lot more done there, too. So the combination of the two makes uh, this situation unique, and that's why our uh, Facebook platform is, is a powerful tool because, you know, the VA knows that all of you are watching what's going on, and me as an attorney and a reporter have the ability to really uh, put the ratchet to them to, to force change in multiple ways. So it's a very powerful opportunity. Uh, you don't want to be a lobbyist, Stephen. That's not what you want to do. Um, and we don't have the power to do that. I mean, come on. You know, what do we got? Billions of dollars growing in our back pocket like the Koch brothers? I mean, no way. We just got to focus on the little bits of change that we can do. It's, uh, think about it more like um, special forces. You know, the, the special forces isn't sent in to go beat the Germans, right? Or some massive, you know, army. The special forces is there to do very small things, insert, extract, kill a few folks, you know, all that small stuff, you know, that, that really can have big change. And that's really what we're all about here, small stuff. Um, so, Stephen, the people that advocate for us on the Hill, um, right now it's Disabled American Veterans, Legion, you know, all the big six. They do advocacy. Some of what they do is great, but they don't care about voc rehab. Voc rehab is just a tiny little thing. So um, it's just they don't care. Nobody cares about this little program except me and you and, and the few of us there. And we're doing it right now. We're, this is, you know, uh, us getting together on Facebook uh, live in this venue is our opportunity to talk about these issues and to spread the word and try to get you know, VA to understand what's going on in our own, you know, complicated situations. Um, and then this is, this is not bad. This is, you know, moving the ball forward. Uh, sometimes it feels like it's maybe not fast enough, but it's, uh, it's what you can do. And after I've been, you know, what, doing this for eight years now, um, we've had some pretty good success uh, without the big budget of DAV, you know, $500 million. You know, they have such deep pockets um, and we don't, we don't have that money. So, you know, to, to be a lobbyist group or to, you know, be on the Hill, that costs a ton of money. And so we got to look at this more strategically. And um, that's really what I focus on. And, you know, people in this group are welcome to reach out with some ideas, you know, uh, and participate. Um, maybe be moderators, you know, we'll open that up for uh, folks who want to volunteer for a few months to, to help us kind of regulate the, the um, communications back and forth to make sure everything is appropriate. And otherwise, you know, I really think that the, you know, the citizens reporter thing, you know, and, and doing FOIAs, me teaching you guys how to, you know, become active citizens uh, by making FOIA requests and Privacy Act requests is probably the biggest tool and would be the the largest thorn in the side because it's cheap to do uh and you could really get a lot of transparency really quick with the right uh system in place um you know uh and it doesn't take 500 million dollars like dav has 
or uh, you know some of those other groups that have huge budgets, but you know you watch what they do with it, and it's eh, not so much. So anyway, love you all. Have a great weekend, and uh, until next time, you know, tune in. You know, all your contributions, sharing links to the uh, the Facebook group here, sharing links to the website disabledveterans.org. You know, buying the book, doing whatever you can to get the word out. That's you know, every little bit helps. Um, and until next time, have a great weekend. Bye now.